we're going to start now our first regional session named Social Protection Responses to COVID-19 Insights from the Region. And I have the pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for this session, Ms. Wendy Walker. Wendy is the Chief of the Social Development Thematic Group at the Asian Development Bank. She's usually based in Manila, but I understand she's currently in the United States near Washington, D.C. So it's also quite late for you, but I'm very happy that you can make it. And I hand you in your capable, I hand you all and over to you so that you can moderate our interesting panels and speakers ahead of us. Wendy, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Jost. And uh, to begin with, I'd just like to say congratulations to Mariana and the team for this has been quite an extraordinary platform over the years, but especially this year, and um, for all the work that's gone into bringing us here together to, today and for this week. So thank you very much. Um, hello to everybody out there. Welcome to the conference, and thank you for joining this first session on social protection responses in Asia and Pacific. It's an honor to be here today and also to have the chance to learn from our speakers on social protection responses to COVID-19 throughout the region. Um, I'd like to remind you that this, that this session will be recorded um, and we will begin with first with the IPC IG, uh, just a second, sorry, just. with the IPCAIG uh, researchers. And then, um, and they will give a quick overview of uh, what has been happening in response in the region and the mapping that they have done. And then um, we will go into a series of country presentations from Pakistan, Indonesia, and, uh, and Cambodia. Uh, the, the, it will be followed by a question and answer session. So as Joe said, please uh, enter all your questions into the chat box as we go along. Panelists may be able to answer some of them there directly and others will be for the discussion at the end. Each presentation will be 12 minutes and um, I really hope that we can stick to that so that we do have some time at the end. So let me briefly introduce you to the full panel. You can read more about them in the conference materials. So this will be very quick. The first is Fabio. Um, Vera Suarez, who is a research coordinator at the International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth. And as a researcher for IPCIG and the Institute for Applied Economic Research, he has worked on impact evaluations of cash transfers and other social programs in countries such as Brazil, Mozambique, Paraguay, and Yemen. And he's joined by Mariana Andrade, who is a researcher at the IPCIG also, and previously worked for the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development and for the International Labor Organization in Bangkok. I'm very pleased, or we're very pleased and honored to have from Pakistan, Dr. Sania Nishtar, who is Special Assistant of Pakistan's Prime Minister and Federal Minister, Poverty Alleviation and Social Safety Minister, Government of Pakistan. She's the founder of the Eshas, program, the government's flagship social protection program, and leads its implementation. She also share, chairs the Benazar Income Support Program and the government of Pakistan's Council on Poverty Alleviation. And from Indonesia, we have Pamaliki, who is the Director of Poverty Alleviation and Social Welfare at the Ministry of National Development Planning, BAPINAS. And he is closely working on issues about poverty, labor, population, and social policy issues and especially the economics of aging. And finally, we have His Excellency Teng Panjatun, who is delegate of the Royal Government of Cambodia in charge of the Director General of Planning. And in this position, he's in charge of governing and supervising the planning and strategic work of several departments under the General Directorate of Planning. During COVID-19 pandemic, he has been the lead, um, he has led the process to identify poor households and households who are affected by COVID-19 through the on-demand identity, identity poor household mechanism. So with those very quick but important introductions, let's start with the first presentation from our IPCIG uh, colleagues, Fabio and Mariana, which provides a snapshot of the social protection responses and mapping across Asia and Pacific. So thank you, Fabio and Mariana. You both have uh, 20 minutes. And audience, uh, please send in your questions in the chat. Thank you. Lovely. Okay, so um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today as well. 
uh, in this uh, important anniversary conference of the sp.org platform, as we saw in the in the video and as the other introductory as the other participants highlighted as well. Today, I'm going to be presenting social protection responses to COVID-19 in Asia and the Pacific, and this is a, a presentation and analysis by me and by Fabio Veras. So, uh, first of all, I would like to explain that this is a mapping uh, that we did of all the social protection responses to COVID-19 in the Global South. It covers design features, linkages with existing programs, changes in coverage, advocacy, other implement implementation changes, legal changes, and financing aspects of social protection programs and systems. Uh, we did this based on an extensive literature review of uh, a desk review of information online in several languages and we conducted this along with the IPCIG research team and also with external consultants and it was funded by UNDP and GIZ. I would like to acknowledge the I'm sorry the acknowledge the participation and support of uh, the following um, participants. So UNICEF South Asia Regional Office and Country Office, uh, IPCIG researchers, IPCIG interns and UNVs who worked in who worked in the mapping. And I would also like to thank uh, Valentina Barca and Rodolfo Beasley for um, supporting the uh, creation of the framework that we are going to use to analyze social protection responses to COVID-19 worldwide. Um, yes, uh, the next slide shows our framework that was already shown by um, our first, our moderator, I think. Um, it uh, covers eight um, aspects of social protection policies and programs. And in this presentation, I'm going to cover number one, coverage, number two, comprehensiveness, number three, adequacy, number four, timeliness and predictability, and number eight, delivery chain. Um, this map shows um, in green the countries in East Asia and Pacific that uh, are covered in the presentation and in the analysis for Asia and the Pacific, and in blue the countries of South Asia. And of all of these countries, we, ha we have mapped responses uh, with the, the exception of uh, Kiribati and Marshall Islands. Um, this is a contextual slide to give you a perspective of uh, the situation of COVID-19 in Asia and the Pacific, but only in the countries that we are covering the presentation. So you note that there are more than 7 million confirmed cases in these countries and more than 100,000 deaths and uh, an average projected GDP growth for 2020 of uh, minus 1.9%. Um, this next map shows uh, social protection responses to COVID-19 by country. You see that the darkest colors correspond to the countries that have more, uh, a larger number of uh, social protection responses to COVID-19. Um, in South Asia, uh, Afghanistan leads in number of social protection responses, followed by Pakistan and India. But we, we should note that uh, Pakistan has the, the highest number of responses because many humanitarian responses were also counted in the, in the case of Afghanistan. And many similar uh, social protection interventions are included in these types of uh, humanitarian interventions. Um, next, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, China is the country with the most social protection responses, followed by Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia. In the small island developing states, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Fiji are countries with the most social protection responses to COVID-19. And out of the 245 social protection responses to COVID-19 that we have mapped, um, the, this was an effort of the, our research team, of course. So it, this number doesn't mean that uh, these are all of the social protection responses to COVID-19 out there. It's just uh, probably uh, an estimation, but out of all of these, we've estimated that the majority consists of social assistance programs. Uh, so 56% of all of the responses are social assistance programs. 
Um, this figure shows, if you look at the list of countries, uh, shows for every country the number of social protection responses to COVID-19. It also shows uh, the number of countries by social protection component, namely social assistance in blue, social insurance in orange, and labor market in green. You see, on the top of the in the top of the figure, uh, they're mostly South Asian countries. They have had more social protection responses to COVID-19, as we have mapped. And, um, and down below, we see more of the uh, small island developing states and uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, the next uh, bar chart, it shows in one of the bars, East Asia and the Pacific, and in the below bar, it shows South Asia. Uh, and the distribution of social protection instruments used uh, within the frame of social assistance programs. So you see that for East Asia and the Pacific and for South Asia, <coughs> the main uh, social protection instruments used were emergency cash transfers, emergency in-kind transfers, and subsidies. In South Asia, especially food subsidies, and in East Asia and Pacific, mostly utilities subsidies. Um, the same um, chart uh, figure for social insurance, we see here um, a little bit more different distribution uh, of social insurance policies in East Asia and Pacific, a more, uh, more distributed um, shares of, of these social protection instruments. And in South Asia, we see mostly um, a little bit of contributory pensions that were uh, policies directed at former workers and the others that mean some life insurance policies uh, mixed with health insurance policies. Sorry. Um, the third uh, bar chart uh, refers to labor market interventions. We can also compare between the two subregions and we see that the, the most frequent uh, social protection instruments in these subregions were um, the same, although um, in East Asian Pacific, uh, the share of um, wage subsidies or relaxation of payment of social security contributions uh, had a, a larger share, whilst in uh, South Asia, the, the flexibility to pay social security contributions and the subsidized credit for payroll had a larger share. Uh, this slide, um, it, the, it is a highlight that we have compiled from our mapping. Uh, it corresponds to countries that um, we thought had um, interesting cases of increased coverage. So, for example, Timor-Leste um, implemented a universal cash transfer to households with monthly income of uh, $500 or below. Tuvalu also <coughs> implemented a universal cash transfer that covered all the citizens of, of the country. Sri Lanka um, had substan substantive horizontal expansion of, of, of their flagship cash transfer programs. Um, and it is estimated that 70% of the population were covered, reaching more than 90% of the poorest decile. And Pakistan, also an interesting case uh, where um, the emergency cash transfer covered more than half of the infected informal workers and three quarters of the vulnerable population. Um, this figure um, shows, um, you see uh, on the list of the names of the programs, it shows new beneficiaries of uh, largest cash transfer programs in Asia Pacific in select selected countries. Um, the light blue uh, bar represents number of new beneficiaries. You see in China, for example, it reaches almost 45 million beneficiaries, new beneficiaries of social protection. Um, the, the orange, no, sorry, the, the dark blue bar uh, corresponds to coverage as share of the population. And you see, for example, uh, uh, Malaysia, the second bar in uh, Sri Lanka or Philippines, they've had a uh, high coverage share, shares of the population. And I've also included in this uh, figure, the benefit as share of uh, average household expenditure. So we can have a, 
an idea of how the benefit uh, relates to uh, general expenditure in the country. We see Indonesia uh, highlights as having a little bit higher adequacy of the benefit compared to these other countries. Um, we can also see in this, in this um, figure um, the duration of the program. So sometimes even um, if the benefit adequacy is a bit higher than the others, we should look at the frequency and the duration of the program to compare those as well. Um, next, um, we had also um, analyzed, um, tried to analyze a bit of the comprehensiveness of the social protection program, programs and systems that we have uh, collected information on. And uh, we see that these were the policies, the main policies addressing immediate vulnerabilities of the population in the Asian Pacific. Uh, so emergency cash or, or in-kind transfers, uh, food subsidies in South Asia and subsidies to, to utilities or consumers taxes. These were um, in, introduced to alleviate household expenses, uh, flexibility to pay social insurance contributions Many countries relaxed previous country conditions of payment to formal sector workers. And finally, wage subsidies. Um, these were implemented in South Asia only in Maldives, but in East Asian Pacific, these were quite um, frequent um, in order to protect jobs and maintain income of the, and consumption of workers. Uh, we've prepared this uh, large table. Um, I, would, I would like you to please focus on the the main, the, the main role, the, the gray role, uh, with the names of the target groups, and on the colors. So <clears throat> the dark blue corresponds to uh, new coverage. Uh, it means that a new program was created to cover these tar target groups. So if you look at the first column and the third column, you see that former workers and poor and vulnerable individuals or households were mostly covered in, uh, in social protection responses to COVID-19. You can also see that uh, frontline workers a little bit ahead in the columns were also uh, more, a bit more covered than others. And you see informal workers as well, uh, having with, with dark blue color, having had uh, increased coverage uh, in the social protection responses to COVID-19 in Asia Pacific. Um, this table, I wanted to highlight um, the fact that countries um, had uh, uh, the difference between the, the date of the first case uh, in blue, the column, the, the column in blue, and the difference, uh, the difference between the first case and the first date of implementation of social protection responses. So I've calculated on average 33 days that uh, these countries have taken to adopt or implement a social protection policy. It's just a proxy for us to, to think about timeliness of response. Um, this, uh, in this um, slide, I would, I'm showing in the bottom of the slide, a table of the most used registration methods for in social protection responses to COVID-19 in Asia Pacific. We see that um, the two columns the two columns with the most uh, countries listed are the, in, the enrollment campaigns. So two of the most used registration methods in Asia Pacific were the enrollment campaigns. Um, uh, many responses that build on existing programs were ill-suited to adequately reach households that were previously excluded from social protection responses. So many countries launched these enrollment campaigns to uh, registrate and include in their registries um, the newly vulnerable uh, individuals. Uh, many countries um, put in place remote registration methods in line with uh, WHO health protocols. And also, if you look at the other column uh, on the table, you see these mostly refer to subsidies, uh, which um, often didn't require a, a um, registration for, for the beneficiaries to be able to benefit from it. Uh, this, I uh, wanted to highlight a few innovative um, delivery chain um, 
uh, innovative delivery chain uh, methods that countries adopted to deliver benefits. So Vietnam, for example, they, they've um, implemented a system of home delivery of social security benefits and the beneficiaries uh, uh, were paid at their homes, basically. In Sri Lanka, um, the, the nutritional supplement, supplement was also delivered at the beneficiary's address. In Philippines, uh, an app was launched so beneficiaries could register and select a mode of payment. And in Cambodia, uh, it has a good example of adaptation of school feeding programs with school cl closures. Um, I think schools were closure, closed in, in Cambodia by March, so uh, programs were adapted so that school children could take the school meals home. And uh, last uh, slide on timeless and predictability. Um, there, what we think that could increase predictability of responses would be uh, the increased um, use of or increased coverage of social registries for social protection targeting. We noted that more developed databases could have speed up the process of implementing more comprehensive social protection responses or social, protect social protection responses with uh, higher coverage. Uh, we see that uh, preparedness of social protection systems could be improved so governments can boost their systems with expanded registries, flexible and on-demand enrollment and final financial inclusion. And we also noted an overall lack of pre-existing universal health access which could have um, uh, sped up also the access to health and health care to individuals that were affected by the pandemic that, that were um, confirmed cases of the pandemic. We, we compiled information that only China, Indonesia, Myanmar, Philippines and Vietnam enacted health insurance policies in response to COVID-19 crisis. <coughs> and we saw that uh, in terms of predictability of uh, healthcare coverage, this is a, a major uh, gap. And uh, I would like to also I mean, this was my presentation. I would like to finalize and bring to you my main messages. So I'm sorry for hurrying up, but this was a, a long presentation that I had to um, summarize. So uh, while in East Asia and Pacific, 90% of uh, social protection responses were emergency cash transfers and utility subsidies. In South Asia, 70% corresponded to the same, but also to emergency in-kind transfers and food subsidies. Uh, the social protection responses to COVID-19 in the region extensively covered former workers and the poor, informal workers and frontline workers next, and uh, the coverage of other target groups uh, were, was less generalized. Um, the benefit adequacy of emergency cash transfers in South Asia was, was generally lower in South Asia than and higher in Southeast Asia. Um, on average, the region took uh, 33 days to implement social protection responses after the first confirmed case in the country, and many countries launched enrollment campaigns for those not yet registered as social protection beneficiaries. Many Asia-Pacific countries followed WHO protocols for innovative delivery of benefits, including with innovative registration and delivery methods, including payments. Almost all, and this is my final, uh, one of my final, final, final remarks, almost all global South countries in Asia Pacific used their social protection systems and implemented new social protection policies and programs to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, even though most Asia Pacific countries used uh, these, these, uh, the existing, existing uh, programs and next structures, to respond to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, most also had to quickly formulate new programs to be able to respond, suggest, should, suggesting that overall shock responsiveness could be improved. Um, and thank you. Um, it was a pleasure for me to participate. And uh, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and uh, me and Fabio, Fabio will try to address them. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mariana, Marina, and uh, for an excellent overview, which captures well the diversity of responses and challenges in the region. Um, I was asked to make a few comments, so we'll try to keep things very brief and forward-looking. 
first in terms of coverage, um, indeed countries were more, with more advanced and updated social registries and digital identification systems were in a better position to expand coverage during the immediate crisis. But what happens to these new beneficiaries moving forward still remains unclear. The priority must be to ensure that vulnerable groups do not suddenly fall out of social protection systems without adequate, uh, um, without adequate um, assessment of their needs and, and vulnerability. In terms of uh, comprehensiveness and, and adequacy, social as you, as you said, social assistance has dominated the social protection response till now globally and also within Asia and Pacific. And this is noteworthy because it suggests that governments recognize the growing evidence base of cash transfer programs to protect the poor and vulnerable. However, in many countries, this has been one-off uh, emergency transfers and uh, um, many households, including those in the informal sector and migrants were first time recipients of government assistance. The crisis has not ended and the combination of lockdowns, business closures, social distancing and economic disruptions continues to impact the incomes, employment and livelihoods of the most vulnerable, particularly those in the informal sector. And we will require more integrated, sustainable and comprehensive social protection programs for these groups during transition and recovery. And these could, should include some combination of social assistance, social insurance and labor market programs, and also the development of new programs such as we see in the Cook Islands, for example, which has initiated a special scheme under which registered businesses can request self-isolation support to cover sick leave taken for self-isolation by employees in line with the public health guidelines. So very much responsive to pandemic um, shifts. In terms of timeliness and predictability, this crisis offers a turning point in the way governments can and should deliver assistance to citizens. The countries like India, Pakistan, Thailand have done this more effectively than some others. And much of the global evidence highlights that the poor require predictable payments in order to plan essential food, health and education expenses. So digital payment infrastructure that is linked with digital identification systems needs to be a priority moving forward for the region and could go a long way to improving financial inclusion for remote and vulnerable households. And finally, sustainability of social protection has uh, multiple components. One is what was raised earlier in terms of the important sustainable financing of social protection programs that will require in-depth analysis and review of taxation, revenues, expenditures, and subsidies to see how to build the fiscal space for evidence-based programs and reduce expenditure from wasteful, inefficient, and unsustainable programs. But there's another side and another piece of the sustainability uh, question, which is figuring out how to take some of the lessons and impacts learn from this crisis and build them into national social protection strategies and programs moving forward. As everybody has been saying in the opening, this crisis offers invaluable lessons and opportunities to really institutionalize good practice so that the following crises will allow for swifter action and decision making. It's clear that social registries in the region are underdeveloped and often outdated. This is a critical piece of the delivery chain that needs to be prioritized moving forward as there is real risk that old surveys, databases, and registries will include vulnerable households and the new poor going forward. So those are just a few comments uh, on, on the overview presentation. And now we will um, move to the country uh, uh, presentations. And the first one is, with, uh, is by Dr. Sania Nishtar, the special assistant of the prime minister in Pakistan. Um, do we have uh, that presentation up and Dr. Nishtar here? Uh, good morning, Dr. Nishtar. Uh, good morning. Okay, is your, is your presentation coming up? Or you're sharing your screen? Uh, yes, we're just doing that in a bit. Okay, I'll probably take a couple of seconds. Thank you. Do you have my screen up with you now? Yes, we see ASAS emergency cash. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to speak about the Pakistan COVID experience and the role of uh, social protection. And I have to say it was delightful to see our ranking up on the, up on the screen a moment ago when Maria was presenting. Um, <clears throat> Let me begin by outlining the context. 
There are 24 million breadwinners in Pakistan that subsist either on daily wages or earn peace rate remuneration or are formally employed, informally employed in Pakistan's very large informal economy. So given the family size, this comes to around 160 million individuals uh, or nearly two thirds of the country's population. And life for them came to a grinding standstill with the lockdowns. So to respond to this challenge, the government of Pakistan created SR's emergency cash, which uh, is the, was the largest social protection program ever in the history of the country. It was rolled out within two weeks of the lockdown to deliver one-time emergency cash grants. Uh, 1.2 billion US dollars were allocated to support more than 16.9 million families, which covers around 109 million people. That is approximately 50% of the country's population. You must be wondering what SR stands for. Well, this is the name for the government's new integrated multi-sectoral poverty alleviation framework. SAS uh, means compa compassion in our local language, Urdu. To deliver SAS emergency cash, we use digital capabilities which had been established over the past year as part of the program. Um, there were three things that helped in particular. Um, a new biometric payment system, which was deployed in 2019, a demand side SMS based request seeking mechanism, and a new wealth profiling data analytics mechanism. So we basically pulled a thread through these three things, these three digital capabilities, which we had developed over the last one year. We combined these all these to provide emergency assistance and we basically adopted a hybrid <clears throat> targeting approach, uh, which was also illustrated on one of the slides that Maria presented, because we combined emergency assistance for the known vulnerable, which are in our social assistance database in any case, and which have been identified through a survey, but we supplemented that with demand-based support for the new poor. We sought requests for assistance through an SMS short code for this new category of vulnerable. As you may be aware, every citizen in Pakistan has a unique 16 digit national identity card number. So we heavily advertised and communicated that anyone who had been impacted by COVID-19 and needed help from the government should send their ID numbers to an 8171 SMS short code service. And we heavily advertised around this opportunity. So it really trickled down to the grassroots level. In over three weeks, we received 139 million requests of which 66 million were unique. We then used data analytics to ascertain eligibility using unique national identification numbers and the PEG and drawing on survey data and wealth proxies. The algorithms were structured in such a way that once the national identity card number arrived, they were checked against many databases and eligibility and regret messages were automatically sent out. We used a number of wealth proxies, history of international travel, ownership of a car, income above a certain level as evidenced by Federal Board of Revenue records, average six month telephone bills over a certain level, expensive processing of documents through executive centers, which the country has, uh, and ownership of land were all used as wealth proxies and therefore people were excluded based on these criteria. Uh, government employees were also excluded and we used their payrolls uh, to, to exclude them. So those that were eligible were sent messages the same day, but they were also told in the same message that they have to wait for another dated message to collect their money because we wanted to manage queues given the COVID context. We then staggered the payment messages. So every day a certain number of messages were sent out to a category of individuals in each union council. Uh, by the way, a union council is our smallest subnational level. Uh, and when the messages were sent out, people, the messages basically said uh, and asked people to go and collect uh, their payments. 
Once they received this message, they would either go to bank branches to collect payment at biometric ATMs or to branches banking retailers and shops. All the payments were biometrically verified in real time. The system was end-to-end data-driven. It was fully automated. It was rule-based. It was transparent and politically neutral. And it truly set a new precedent in, in the country. The impact was truly humbling. Uh, I was constantly on monitoring visits. Uh, and wherever I'd go, I'd meet a huge throng of people. And during the course of these months when the payments were being delivered, I met daily wage laborers without work for weeks, their families on the verge of starvation, hawkers forced out of work due to the lockdown, staff from otherwise busy hotels now sitting at home, domestic servants, part-time guards, gardeners, drivers, um, security personnel, industrial daily wage, wages laid off by the employers. There were fishermen and miners and transport contractors and bus drivers and hawkers uh, suddenly out of a job. There were beauticians and barbers otherwise making a decent living suddenly with no customers. I met shopkeepers who were there by the millions on the verge of hunger with savings consumed. There were private school teachers in, with severance letters. I met countless electricians, welders, painters, carpenters, plumbers, car mechanics construction labor, not knowing where the next meal was coming from. There were taxi drivers who had not had a passenger for weeks. And this story was repeated across industries and geographies. So the, 12, so the rupees 12,000, which is the equivalent of 75 US dollars, the handouts that the government was giving brought stability and comfort to the families. And the whole nation watched as millions of tragedies were averted. For me personally, it was the most humbling experience of my entire career to be leading these operations and to disperse money to half the people of my country at a time of extreme uncertainty. We conducted a telephonic survey even as the cash was being dis dispersed, in fact, at the tail end. And the results showed us that 97% of the beneficiaries were, were, had utilized the full amount. And 93% had actually spent it entirely on food and rations. For Pakistan, this was truly a watershed moment in terms of government functioning. It made the government more agile, more data-driven, more experimental and ambitious. It helped us fast track the adoption of cost-effective digital ways of working and new ways of coordinating across multiple stakeholders and deploying a whole of government approach. And we gained deep know-how in designing and implementing a massive nationwide program in real time in a context of extreme complexity and uncertainty with, with speed. Uh, overall, this bolstered confidence in the government's ability to do things transparently. And I think that this was one of the most important takeaways for us at a national level. Um, the, the transparency features of, of this program were, were quite unprecedented because we put out each and every detail, shred of detail out in the open for, for public consumption. There were many challenges, though, uh, and to begin with, there were certain risks envisaged at, in at inception. Uh, the first of them was that we were basically was that we were rolling out operations during a very difficult environment. Uh, spread of disease was a risk. The operations were being carried out during a lockdown when public transport was suspended. So we were conscious that the largest social protection program was being conducted in an extremely difficult environment. We took measures against all the risks that you saw up on the screen, and we adopted a whole of government approach. When we locked down, when we rolled out, there were additional challenges. Logistics and connectivity issues emerged because we were 
verifying biometrics in real time. Liquidity became a challenge in remote areas. We were constantly under cyber attacks by unscrupulous element. So we developed a mechanism of real-time evaluation and round-the-clock surveillance and address these challenges on the go. Then there were those beneficiaries that experienced biometric failure for which we had to set up an alternative mechanism. There were limitations of data-driven messaging, evident in uh, you know, payment notifications to dead beneficiaries for which we had to deliver, develop an additional workaround. We also had to develop a new incentive mechanism for the retailers uh, the, the retailers uh, of branchless banking operators who were reluctant to work in a difficult situation. So, the, so for the fiscal measures that were adopted and the tax breaks that were given, we had to go to federal, federal and provincial cabinets. And that is not easy uh, when, when the government was basically uh, operating at bare capacity during the environment of the lockdown. We constantly had to struggle with low financial and digital literacy. And I think Wendy talked about the importance of digital, uh, of financial literacy and the, the, the salience of uh, uh, financial inclusion as a means of uh, uh, poverty graduation and social protection. And I couldn't agree more with you, Wendy, because we constantly had to struggle with that. And if our population was more financially and digitally literate, our job would have been a lot easier. Uh, and it was the lack of this literacy that led to long queues that thronged payment centers, and even those who had not received data, dated messages were queuing, which was, which was our biggest challenge. So towards the end of the payment period, there were around 1.9 million people who still didn't turn up to collect that, their cash despite being eligible, and that again, as Wendy very, very rightly outlined, was because of lack of financial literacy. And one of the key, key questions that we have for the impact evaluations that are now being commissioned is to ascertain why that was the case. But despite these difficulties, the impact of the program was deeply overwhelming. Getting cash into the hands of 15 million families at a time of extreme uncertainty was, was a truly humbling experience. But here I would like to point out that the legacy of this program is not just short-term relief. Built into its design are longer-term uh, objectives to strengthen overall safety nets and use new poverty graduation approaches such as financial inclusion, uh, which we believe will bring lasting benefits to recipient and the country as a whole. At our own country level, we are now focused on redefining uh, poverty and vulnerability in the post-COVID context. Uh, the, uh, I hope we will soon call it the post-COVID context. I don't think we can as yet say that with the disease raging. Uh, in our country, the policy discourse is ongoing on the horizontal and vertical scale of assistance that the government will now be giving to individuals going forward. And not just cash transfers, under the multi-sectoral SARS umbrella we have, even in the COVID situation, expanded our conditional cash transfer program, uh, the education conditional cash transfer program nationwide. Even when COVID was raging, we rolled out a nutrition and health conditional cash transfer to hedge nutrition and education against the economic fall out of COVID. Uh, and we have expanded our cash for work program, which provides interest-free loans to the disadvantaged. So, uh, to, to, so, so um, I, I will just finish in a moment. Uh, in terms of lessons for an international audience, our experience shows us squarely that by combining phones, internet connectivity, and unique identification numbers, a digital demand-based system can be created uh, at scale. Um, our experience has also demonstrated how cash transfers can be deployed to counter the socioeconomic fallout due to external shock. Um, and, and we feel that these uh, lessons are important uh, for scaling up social protection, which I personally believe is one of the most important policy tools in a post-COVID uh, context. Um, we as a government are conscious that the MDGs and poverty eradication 
uh, were achieved several years ahead of schedule, but now with the SDGs, we are moving sadly backwards and very fast. So uh, it is absolutely critical that we focus on poverty alleviation and social protection in a post-COVID context. Uh, and we believe that a strong, strong social protection system is one of the best ways to address rising inequality. Uh, SRS is our, impact, our attempt to impact on that. And we look forward to working very closely with international partners to learn from others. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishtar, for a very interesting uh, and, and uh, forward-looking presentation. I'd like to um, re request everybody to please send in your questions in the chat box and now turn quickly to Pamaliki from Indonesia to give us the perspective from that country and the experience over the last months. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, sh should I share my presentation or? Yes. Okay, I'll share myself then. Uh, thank you again uh, for the introduction, uh, Wendy. And also thank you for the committee has uh, invited me to the event. Uh, it is an honor for me to speak uh, in this uh, worldwide e conference in regards to our experience uh, responding to the pandemic of it. Let me, okay. So uh, let me begin uh, with our condition before the pandemic COVID-19 uh, has affected us. Uh, Indonesia made uh, history only two years ago by reaching the milestone uh, of a single uh, digit poverty for the first time since uh, its independence in 1947. So poverty rate fell uh, below 10% in 2018. Uh, which is 9.6% uh, and further uh, reduced to 9.41 in March uh, 2019. In average, uh, we can reduce number of the poor population for about uh, 650,000 per year. Uh, so uh, then uh, we can reach actually 24.7 million by the end of the last year. So one recipe of the achievement is that uh, we have more uh, comprehensive social protection more integrated economic empowerment, uh, as well as uh, better basic infrastructures, especially at the village level, because uh, we have uh, nationwide uh, village funds already started uh, around 19, uh, 2015. So there is also an increasing awareness uh, of more accurate uh, data uh, for targeting uh, purposes at the local level. So despite of uh, the need of more uh, systematic uh, updating, uh, the by name, by address, uh, data become the key to improve the synchronizations of uh, social protection programs before the pandemic COVID-19. In addition, uh, the data also become uh, leverage uh, to transform the delivery mechanisms from cash to digitalizations of social assistance uh, distributions. Uh, the single digit achievement uh, motivated us actually uh, to move faster in eradicating chronic poor uh, five years earlier. Just before the pandemic of it, uh, the president uh, actually uh, uh, mandated us uh, to uh, design the policy, uh, the social protection policy on how we can achieve uh, zero chronic poverty earlier than 2030. So our, our social protections has addressed uh, I think uh, one of the key of the social protection is uh, to achieve this chronic poor is on how we can actually uh, uh, design a more inclusive, especially to address the informal sectors, uh, low educated household head, uh, people with disability, uh, household with uh, female household head, uh, subsistence farmer, and also people in a disadvantaged area. Uh, following the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the poverty uh, could once again rise, uh, undoing years of uh, positive uh, trends on uh, poverty alleviation. Uh, the outbreak uh, threatens uh, Indonesia's entire gain in reducing poverty. Currently, we have uh, over more than 200, I think uh, by today, we have like 300,000 uh, cases. The pandemic has declined the economic activities and decreased people's income. So while all are infected, uh, affected, uh, this uh, pandemic hurts the poor uh, the most. 
uh, as uh, Dr. Sinistra also mentioned, that uh, once after the uh, the lockdown, uh, we hardly seen uh, all the sec uh, informal sectors uh, selling their products, uh, say it's like uh, all in the streets. So this is all silence. It means like uh, they 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 really quite uh, 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 hit very hard by this uh, crisis. So we estimate an increase around 4 million of new poor by the end of the year. Based on economic growth forecasted each quarter, uh, the estimation given in two scenarios, with thought and also additional uh, with uh, intervention of social safety nets. So without the intervention, as you can see here, a poverty rate could reach uh, as much uh, as higher as 10.63%. Uh, or around, uh, we, we will have like 28.7 million uh, of poor people. So with proper intervention, uh, the poverty could be as low as around 9.7% uh, or 26 million, uh, 2 million more uh, of the poor compared to the baseline in September 2019, where the poverty has reached 9.22%. Uh, so this means that the social safety net uh, could potentially keep around 2 million people from falling into poverty. Uh, not that uh, this is also uh, have to be translated into reality with strong preconditions, uh, which is actually accurate uh, beneficiaries data. Uh, in response to that, uh, the government issued uh, fiscal stimulus in the form of expanded social uh, assistance and increased benefit level uh, covering almost 4% uh, of uh, the GDP in terms of budgets. And uh, the uncertainty of the effect of uh, the pandemic COVID-19 made us increase the coverage of the program as much as possible. The trade-off is that we need to reduce uh, as well as to readjust a budget of other unrelated programs at both uh, local as well as the central government. So the programs uh, is uh, categorized into four programs which is health services uh, that includes expansion of uh, premium subsidized uh, recipients for national uh, health insurance, uh, basic needs uh, as the main uh, social assistance uh, consisting of uh, cash transfers or food assistance, uh, job security uh, which is consists of an, uh, employment benefits uh, to secure basic incomes uh, for the number of uh, for the member of the uh, National uh, Social Insurance for Workers. Uh, we call it BPJS Ketenaga Kerjaan. Also, we have uh, reskilling programs uh, providing financial incentive for micro, small, medium enterprises. And the last one is economic recovery for, uh, by providing uh, financing additional uh, capital, loan restructurizations of ultra micro enterprises, uh, prov providing uh, working capital for state-owned enterprises, also other incentive programs for ultra micro enterprises. So into more detail, we have quite busy uh, tables here, uh, consisting all the regulars, I uh, mean expanding of the regular uh, programs, also the additional or uh, non-regular programs that is uh, accredited uh, by uh, for responding to COVID. So in details, the programs includes here the conditional cash transfers or PKH uh, for 10 million families or around 20% of the poorest. Uh, the benefits increases by 25%. Uh, then uh, it will be also distributed monthly for nine months. Uh, before the pandemic COVID, this conditional cash transfers distributed only uh, three, uh, once in three months. So uh, the non-cash uh, food assistance of, uh, for 20 million families expanded by uh, from uh, 15.2 million uh, to around 20 million beneficiaries, covering almost like 30% of the poorest. Uh, the benefit increases uh, from 200, uh, become 200,000 uh, from 150,000 per month. Uh, we also have uh, social cash assistance uh, targeting uh, small uh, outside Jakarta. I think this one, uh, this one is for 9 million uh, beneficiaries. Uh, this one is around 30 to 40 percent of the poorest. So we make sure that uh, all of the programs here is not overlap between uh, the PK, conditional cash transfers, food assistance, uh, food assistance for uh, for Jakarta area, also food assistance for outside Jakarta area. 
So this one uh, makes uh, the, the beneficiaries actually coverings uh, more than like 40%, uh, almost maybe 50% of the total population. Uh, the special assistance for the Jabodetabek. Jabodetabek is Jakarta metropolitan area, around 1.9 million uh, total uh, that uh, affected uh, families around Jakarta and metropolitan uh, more metropolitan area. Uh, we are give uh, we give them the forms of food. Uh, the beneficiaries also uh, include some micro businesses, uh, ultra micro businesses, uh, informal sectors. Uh, seasonal art workers, uh, also other informal workers outside PKH. Uh, also, we have the national health. Uh, we we also, in addition to the to the the, the social assistance uh, given by the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs, we also have the uh, uh, social assistance given by the Village Fund. Uh, this is unconditional uh, cash transfers uh, funded uh, to. Uh, uh, support like around uh, 11 million beneficiaries uh, around uh, nine months with the same amount of the social uh, cash assistance. So uh, meaning that it is actually improved the coverage uh, from 50% uh, to around maybe 60, uh, yeah, just uh, around uh, 50, above 55% uh, of the uh, coverage. Uh, there is an additional uh, programs uh, starting from uh, this August, uh, this like a rise assistance, additional social cash assistance, and then we also continue the social assistance into more productive assistance, and also wage assistance for workers. So this one is part of the economic recovery uh, uh, programs. In terms of the uh, distributions method, we actually combined uh, between some of the programs has already been established by uh, giving them cashless uh, programs uh, with uh, 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 bank accounts such as the uh, conditional cash transfers as well as the food assistance. But uh, and then we also have the uh, uh, distributed by uh, what we call postal offices uh, uh, through uh, by uh, uh, postal, uh, postal offices. And then we also have this uh, in terms of our voucher. Uh, I forget to mention that we also subsidize the uh, electricity for uh, poor people. We have like uh, uh, subscribe around 450 voltage uh, capacity of the electricity uh, and this covering around 24 million households. Also, uh, we also like discounted 50% of the rates of uh, electricity bill for 7.2 million households who have 900 voltage capacity in their, uh, host, uh, in their homes. Uh, most of this uh, assistance uh, is uh, extended uh, before uh, and in the first stage, this assistance is only covering until uh, June and then we uh, extend into December. Uh, so it will have like a nine months uh, coverage uh, from April to December. So, uh, Yes, uh, based on our uh, experiences, uh, we need to, uh, we have some lesson learned. And uh, one, uh, the first one is that we uh, actually uh, try to uh, improve uh, or increase the coverage of the data that we have uh, into a social registry covering uh, ideally 100%. But next year, uh, it uh, gradually uh, increased into 60% and we are going to have national wide uh, updating of this uh, data. We also need to, uh, uh, we need to create a coordination of protocols because it seems like coordination between the line ministers uh, need quite a strong co uh, protocols uh, for a complex coordination among the government uh, from local and also the, uh, the central government. We also uh, need to have a, a sustainable financing scheme. Uh, we also need to uh, improve the interoperability, also integration between the social assistance and also the economic uh, empowerment. So then uh, the, uh, uh, the programs will, uh, will improve uh, the economic situations, uh, hopefully after the pandemic uh, stopped. And then uh, the last one is that we are also trying to uh, design an, a more adaptive social protections. So large variations of benefits, uh, special assistance, and also uh, multiple targeting 
uh, double targeting. Uh, this one uh, can be addressed if uh, there is any shocks, either natural uh, disaster, uh, climate change, as well as this uh, kind of pandemic. I think that's all uh, what uh, we can uh, uh, provide you and uh, looking forward for the discussion. Thank you, Wendy. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pamaliki. Again, to everybody, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat bar. So now we go quickly to the last presentation. Again, just 12 minutes, please, with uh, His Excellency uh, Ten Pajertan from uh, Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, first of all, on behalf of the the Royal Government of Cambodia. Uh, I would appreciate and thank you, uh, thank to organizer for organize uh, such kind of this uh, the uh, conference turning the COVID-19 uh, crisis into a, a opportunity. What the next for the social protection? I think this is a very good opportunity for uh, us to discuss on this, which we can learn from each other and then we can uh, help up uh, uh, people during this crisis. So let me uh, say about the Cambodian uh, uh, social protection response to COVID-19. Uh, oh, okay. So my presentation I have divided into three parts. The first is COVID-19 situation in Cambodia. And second, Cambodia social protection response, and the last is success factor and lesson learned. For the first point, as the report from the Ministry of uh, Health in uh, 2nd October 2020, we uh, confirmed 2,078 uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 with uh, 275 recovery. So uh, Cambodia is not uh, much different from other during the crisis of uh, COVID-19. The COVID-19 has impact uh, to uh, uh, economic of Cambodia, such as the uh, uh, export, tourists, uh, uh, foreign, foreign direct investment, and also construction. This is uh, uh, in terms of economic. And uh, as the uh, GDP, as uh, usually Cambodia, Cambodian economic grow around 70% annually. But uh, during this uh, crisis, we found maybe uh, our economic grow like uh, negative. For the uh, impact of the uh, uh, COVID-19 as uh, 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 estimated by the uh, ADB, so we may, uh, uh, our people may affect around like 1.3 million of Cambodian fell into the poverty. Next slide, please. For Cambodia social protection response uh, uh, during the uh, COVID-19, as you may aware, uh, the government of Cambodia has launched our national social protection policy framework 2016-2025 in uh, uh, last 2018. And to implement the social protection policy, the government of Cambodia has used uh, the has used data from ID, ID, identification of the poor household, we call ID poor. Uh, for uh, this purpose, which the ID pool, we start, the government of Cambodia has started the, our program since uh, 2005. And the ID pool uh, uh, program uh, strongly support from the uh, German and Australian government throughout the uh, GIZ in Cambodia. And ID pool, we have combined objective of the uh, of the proxy uh, mean of test and affordable affordability of community based selection process and now the our our program has covered uh, 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 the nas nationwide which include rural and urban area 
and we update only we, uh, as uh, show in the uh, website here. For the purpose of ID pool, especially the people who holding the ID pool card, that those people can access to a uh, healthcare with the free. And also for the cash transfer, especially before the uh, even before and during the COVID-19, uh, 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 the people, especially the poor pregnant, the poor pregnant, they can receive cash transfer also for the children under two. And another uh, support is uh, they can get a scholarship for the children when they send the children to the school. And also they can get um, a benefit such as the, the children when they go to school, they can get the uh, uh, food uh, supplement from the government as well. But uh, maybe from other civil society, especially from an uh, 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 NGO, they can provide other support to the poor who are holding the uh, equity card from the uh, ID pool as well. Next slide, please. During this uh, uh, COVID-19, the government of Cambodia has reserved uh, the budget more than one billion US dollar for release package, not only for the social, for economic as well, but for the uh, cash transfer to the poor household uh, uh, through uh, ID Poor program. We, uh, the government allocate around uh, three million US dollar and the actor, the main actor to implement the uh, ID pool program is uh, the first is uh, from uh, the Ministry of Planning and Ministry of Social Affairs uh, with the trend and geod habitation and other. For MOP, we provide uh, the data for the government and Ministry of uh, Social Affairs, uh, they uh, register and provide the benefit and payment to the uh, the poor household who holding the equity card. And also we uh, the people who are holding the uh, uh, equity card, they can receive uh, the e-payment, e-payment uh, monthly at the uh, local brand in which nearby the uh, they are uh, uh, living. For example, if I, like the poor household who are uh, holding equity card has received uh, the minimum, the minimum is 44 US dollar. This is a minimum at the rural area and the, uh, uh, the at the rural area and they, they, they cl we classify them as the poor one because in Cambodia, uh, the poor in Cambodia through the ID poor program we classify into two. One is the poor one uh, and another is poor two, which the poor two is not really like heavy poor as the poor one. Please next slide. During the, uh, the COVID-19, the, the government, uh, we uh, already uh, share, uh, share information to the poor if the people who think they are poor or they just impact by the COVID-19, so those people can go to the commune uh, authority and apply for the uh, uh, ID poor card. And this is we uh, start to implement just recently in May to, uh, 2020 which cover the whole commune in the country, which here we mentioned 1,656 commune in the country. And uh, during, uh, even we start in May, but uh, uh, the process to implement uh, ODI the poor is very quick. We, at the beginning, we provide the, uh, the training uh, to all the, uh, a communal authority and uh, uh, we through uh, uh, a personal uh, protective uh, equipment 
And also, if those commune at the remote area, we provide uh, 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 the training through video. video. And uh, during this uh, ODI OD pool, we, we use uh, digital technology for data collection and management. Uh, we, call, we use a tablet for uh, this purpose. Next slide, please. So here I just uh, uh, provide some uh, photo, very useful photo that uh, uh, show our activity to identify the poor households, uh, uh, starting from we identify the poor household to the people who receiving equity card receive the cash uh, uh, transfer. Like the first photo is family uh, a family interview uh, when we we uh, recognize them as the poor. And the second, after we interview, so all the family that we interview come to, to uh, uh, review and decide by the commune sangkat at the commune level. That is the second photo. And the third, after we, uh, we, we recognize them as the poor household, and then we issue equity card for them that that if now the the uh, commune authority provide the equity card to uh, the poor household when they receive equity card and those people they have to bring equity card to register at the uh, a commune authority before they go to the last photo they can uh, get the uh, uh, cash transfer from the, the, the wing we call the local uh, local brand that is called wing so it this is our process start from the beginning until those people have received a uh, uh, equity, uh, equity card and receive uh, the cash transfer from our our government so next slide please so here we we saw the uh, the uh, the graph which uh, the result for result that we identify the poor household here we just start uh, this is we, we we just want to show you about the um, how the number that we we identify the poor household starting from may when the government start uh, the program for the the customs were to the poor household so at the beginning in may so the number of the poor household like a huge number of the poor household uh, come to uh, uh, the commune and then we we uh, interview and accept them and provide the, the custom uh, provide them the equity card but uh, uh, starting from june the number is not big as the, at the beginning in may and then later on like in, in september so this number like uh, coming down and uh, uh, reducing Two minutes, so please. Uh, in total, the result. So we found a new new uh, poor household more than one thousand uh, seven hundred uh, uh, seven hundred and eight thousand uh, poor household is starting from May, and then totally is uh, more than uh, six uh, uh, hundred forty four thousand household, which around uh, two point five billion of the poor household have received cash transfer from the government. And until uh, September, the government has uh, has spent more than uh, seven, 70, uh, 77 million US dollar already for uh, the poor household. So next slide, please. So come to the last point. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, we found the the uh, the success and lesson learned from the the, the uh, uh, social protection of the Cambodia. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, emerged uh, cash transfer is the, for the country wide and starting very immediately uh, uh, in May. So it means that we can see the, uh, this program is successful, which uh, we can use this for uh, the nights after the COVID-19 as well. And the cash transfer not only uh, cash transfer just help the most affected uh, people and also can accelerate uh, the consumption and stimulate the economy of the country as well. And even we starting to use uh, 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 digital technology for this program, but the people, especially the uh, authority, our local authorities starting to adapt 
the new uh, technology as well. And uh, we found the coordination because of uh, even this is starting immediately. So we found the, uh, the coordination among the agency, uh, not only at the, uh, at the national level, but at the local level also, we still have a problem. So we have to improve uh, our uh, coordination agency as well. And the uh, last, please to move to the next slide. Okay, thank you so much for uh, your kind attention and I'm pleased to waiting uh, uh, to respond if you have any uh, need my clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this was an excellent set of presentations um, from the overview to each one of the country sessions. We are running out of time. Um, and I just want to um, briefly, uh, I'll end with one final question to each one of you, but also just pepper you with a few of the ideas that were coming through. One was on uh, whether or not Pakistan will move to on-demand application. Uh, another is questioning the um, a question about the types of governance uh, mechanisms across each, each of the countries. And the third on what has been the role of civil society. But uh, to ask an encompassing question here at the end with just maybe uh, two minutes for each of you, uh, what do you think are the main lessons learned from the crisis so far for your country and what do you believe are going to be the next steps? Can I start uh, maybe with uh, Dr. Nishtar, please? Uh, well, well, thank you for that question. Uh, in terms of um, the lessons learned, I think the most important lesson was that uh, for us was that it is important um, that, that it's entirely possible for the government to deliver at scale with integrity and efficiency because there is a um, I mean there's a general myth that it is the private sector that can do things with uh, at scale in an efficient way it is the private sector that has the inherent incentive structures to do um, to embrace innovation. And I think for us, a SaaS emergency cash has somewhat shattered that myth. It's possible for the government to deliver uh, and to embrace innovation. Uh, but the other important lesson is that uh, you have to be able to have the ability to join the dots. Uh, and to deliver programs at such a scale, you have to have the ability to mobilize whole of government and to uh, mine whatever competencies require, that you require from various agencies. And that is not easy because we often think that the government is one entity. The government is usually not one entity. It's an archipelago of various institutions and departments that have a disincentive to collaborate. Uh, so when you develop, deploy, develop and deploy large scale programs, you need competencies from various agencies. Um, and to develop that in incentive structure and that culture is, is, um, is what is required. Um, and it's, our experience showed that it's possible to do that. Um, it, also in terms of the lessons learned, for us, this was quite a transformative experience because we have totally shifted to digital ways of working. Uh, that is the silver lining, uh, you know, behind the COVID's dark cloud. Uh, of course, there are many other lessons that we've learned, but, but just quickly moving to the other segment of your, of your question, which was about the next steps. Uh, I think in terms of the next steps, we, we are beginning to realize that in the post COVID context, um, there will be livelihood disruptions uh, despite all that we are doing and social protection will have a very important role. So we are, as I mentioned during my uh, opening comments also, we are trying to redefine the level of poverty and vulnerability. Uh, the policy discourse is ongoing on the vertical and horizontal scale of social protection arrangements uh, under SAS. Uh, but I think we as a country are on somewhat of a strong footing because even prior to COVID, uh, social protection was um, a priority for, for our government. Uh, and the investments that we made in creating the institutional infrastructure and the digital 
uh, backbone is now uh, is is now helping us scale things up. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Pamaliki. Uh, lessons and next steps or um, priorities for for work going forward. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Wendy. Uh, actually, most of them is already mentioned by uh, Dr. Sinistra that uh, the the main lesson learned uh, from our uh, last like a few months is coordination coordination among uh, line ministers uh, at the central level government, as well as uh, from the uh, central government to the uh, local government. Uh, we, uh, uh, this coordination is actually ensuring the integrations between the programs. So as what you see uh, in our uh, tables that we actually we have quite a lot of variations of the social assistance. This coordination is ensuring how that this uh, social assistance doesn't received uh, by uh, like overlapped uh, targets, you know. So this uh, requires a lot of communications between the central and also the local government. This way, you know, for the next step or for this case is that we uh, we are actually developing the uh, social uh, protection reform uh, for the next uh, two years, uh, for next three years until 2024 on how we can uh, improve uh, the integrations, also the interoperability of the programs. Uh, among the social protections itself, uh, as well as uh, with the economic empowerment uh, programs that also uh, 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 implemented by quite a lot of line ministers. And then the second one is the most important one is uh, because of this integrations also interoperability requires uh, accurate data. Uh, the the, the, the uh, past like five months we realized that we need to uh, update the data uh, more uh, accurately, also more uh, in a routine basis. Uh, so uh, based on our regulations, actually the local government have the authority to update uh, by name by address data for targeting programs. But uh, we realized in the, uh, in the last years, uh, there is uh, uh, not really have, uh, I mean, the local government doesn't have really a good capacity or enough capacity to update the data based on like a standard that have, has already set by the Central Statistical Bureau. So our lesson learned here is that we are going to have like a national wide uh, updating data in 2021. And we are preparing for that uh, starting from now. Also, we are planning to have a nationwide capacity building for the local government. So then this updating data of the social registry uh, can be gradually uh, uh, transfers to the local government. So then uh, our aim is that we have 100% uh, of social registry by 2024. And we also aim for uh, updating uh, a process of this uh, uh, the data uh, fully by the local government by 2024. Uh, other than that, I guess we also, uh, as I uh, previously mentioned, that we are uh, creating or uh, designing the adaptive social protections. Uh, I think that's all, uh, Wendy. Okay, thank you very much, Pamaliki. And from Cambodia, lessons learned and next steps or priorities going forward? Uh, thank you, Wendy, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity for the last uh, 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 step. Uh, for the uh, lesson learned and next step for Cambodia, as I mentioned in, our, in my presentation that we, the government, we have uh, uh, launched our national social protection policy framework for 2016 to 2025. So I think it's the most point uh, most priority is uh, there. But uh, when we start to implement, and especially during the COVID-19, I think we found like the issue over there that should be uh, reconsidered and uh, re, uh, uh, or amendment our policy. Especially uh, most point that I'm going to, uh, to mention like uh, covered by a previous two speaker already. The first one I, I, I consider about the, uh, the role of coordination because of during the COVID, we found the, uh, the coordination not only uh, from the national to uh, subnational level or to the commune 
uh, uh, local level, uh, even at the national level, uh, the coordination between the ministry and the ministry also the issue, and the ministry to the uh, to the local level also the issue. So so this is we have to consider one. And second is about the capacity. The capacity because of uh, uh, during the COVID, uh, so the people that it they afraid, so they scare. So we have to use the uh, the IT uh, ICT for our work. Even like now, uh, our meeting, our conference through a video conference. So this need the capacity of the people uh, to do to. to uh, to adapt or to capture all this point. And the third, I think infrastructure. Infrastructure is very important to, uh, to build and to adapt the, the, uh, 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 the after the, the, the COVID-19, that is very important. The last point I think is very, the most very important about the, the budget. Because of like uh, 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 Cambodian government, we have reserved the budget for uh, to relieve and uh, to provide the cash transfer to uh, our poor and to to mitigate the impact of uh, our economy. So this, if we have to consider and have, should be like much uh, uh, consider and to be clear for reserve and have the, the budget for to relieve and to mitigate the issue, uh, uh, something happen in the future. I think that all from uh, Cambodia side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to thank very much all of our distinguished presenters for the very rich overviews of the response in the region and across each of your countries. This has been a a real masterclass with people who have been in the driver's seat um, over these last few months. And I'm just so sorry that we don't have more time to ask more questions, um, not only about what you've learned, but about what are the priorities going forward? What are some of the concerns that you see coming down the path? But maybe that will have to be for the next, uh, for the next uh, session. And I just wanna thank each of you and Mariana also for this wonderful kickoff for the first regional session. And now with that, I pass the mic over to Joss Wagner, who will explain the next activity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you to all our distinguished speakers today. So yes, I, I agree with Wendy. That's very unfortunate. We can't dig deeper and, and, and continue the conversation. But uh, we have, unfortunately, a pretty strict uh, time regime here so that uh, we start on time and try to finish on time. So thanks again, Wendy Walker, for moderating in an excellent way the session. And uh, let's go on in the program. And the program says we are going to have a coffee break, but we just wanted to give you a teaser what's coming after the coffee break because you will have the chance to share with your peers on your social protection experiences, your social protection um, ideas in regard to COVID-19. Yeah, so what are your lessons learned and the potential ways forward for countries in the region? And maybe you can even address some of the um, questions in your own groups. And we're doing it in a, in a kind of a World Cafe style. So you're going to meet eight, nine, ten people in, in your groups. And so it's an intimate conversation. So, so we, I think you will enjoy it because you're going to meet some of your colleagues. Um, but um, how long are we going to have the coffee break? And there is a special surprise for you. We're going to have a five minute coffee break. So that should be enough to get a coffee or refresh yourself. And then when you hear the sound on your computer, so I recommend that you keep the sound, the loudspeaker on. Then we have a special uh, kind of show or entertainment for you. We have a South African magic champion with us and Mr. Stuart Lightbody, and he will bring some magic into your life. So when you get your coffee and you hear the sound, come back and stay with us and see some real magic by a real expert on magic. And then we are going to straight into our peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. So 
this is it's for the first part of our session for the Asia, for Asia and the Pacific. So in, in about five minutes from now, when the sound comes up and you hear my voice, then please come back. I will introduce Stuart one more time and then we see some magic and then we're going to have our peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. So thank you so much. Thank you again, Wendy and all our three speakers from Cambodia, Indonesia and Pakistan and also our colleague from IPC IG who were sharing some interesting information and knowledge at the beginning of our session. So take a good short break and see you in a few minutes from now. See someone, there is one webcam on and Sonia is actually working and I think uh, she can wave at us. I think, can we give a close up to her? Yes. Hello, Sonia, also from South Africa, like Stuart, and uh, she's working very intensively on key takeaways, and we see her preliminary results later in about an hour from now, or 45 minutes. Thanks so much, Sonia, looks already great, and um, so we see more of you in about 45 minutes from now. Thanks. So let's go to our peer-to-peer -peer exchange on country experiences, lessons learned, and the potential ways forward for countries in the region. And we are going to use a format that some of you probably know as World Cafe, where we have these kind of intimate conversations at tables about topics that matter. And of course, we want to talk about social protection. And we have prepared three questions for you that's quite ambitious. Um, so best practices, what did my country do well and what can others learn from it? So focus on what has worked or what works in the COVID-19 crisis. What could have my country have done better and why? And what have you learned at the end, like a joint reflection from the peer-to-peer -peer discussion that you can apply to your own country context? So the World Cafe guidelines apply, so that means we want you to speak about what matters to you, but in brackets, don't go on and on. So everybody should have a chance to share. And for that reason, we ask each group, and you will be randomly allocated, to choose a facilitator, to choose a person who ensures that everybody has his or her turn to share. And secondly, maybe one person in your group can be a so-called recorder, a, not a documenter, but a person who listens very carefully and suggests at the end, maybe the last three, four, five minutes, two or three insights from your conversation. And these two or three insights we would like later to see in the chat box when we are coming back to plenary. So, it can be also for qualitative comments, but uh, you don't have to, to discuss for length, but maybe there are three key messages, common ground you would like to share with the rest of the uh, audience. So this is what we would like you to do. So in a moment, my colleagues will actually send you to your uh, breakout rooms or tables, virtual tables, we request you to switch on the webcam because then you can all see each other. And if you feel like you want to introduce yourself, uh, please do so. And we're going to allocate about 35 minutes, 35 minutes for that conversation. And that should give you plenty of time to dig deep. So don't be shy, but um, talk to each other, switch on your webcam and have a good conversation. And we like to hear from you in 35 minutes. We will bring you back. You don't have to travel anything, pack a bag or so. You will be automatically coming back to the plenary. So I will request now our colleagues to open the breakout rooms. I think um, that's a quick uh, preview of what you should maybe do today, maybe tomorrow or on, on the 7th. And on the 8th, we are all going to meet again in the big plenary across three time zones. We are going to continue um, with uh, a session in about 
one hour and 14 minutes from now, then the, the next session starts for Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and North Africa. If you want to join, you're most welcome. Please make sure that you go to the to your individual program that you maybe skip the opening again, of course, so that you can go straight into the presentation from Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. And if you are a person who cannot sleep at night, in the evening from 9, 9 p.m. Jakarta time onwards, we're going to have the Latin American and the Caribbean session with another couple of interesting country experiences. And so um, I wanted to see if I can uh, if I, I can see a visual from Sonia, either already a screenshot or maybe a quick view of Sonia and her board, if it's possible, because it's time to wrap up for today. So, okay, so Sonia is sharing a screen, so you have already a preview and she will continue working on that. And I, I think, um, let me share maybe one minute, uh, some rather personal highlights. So I think we saw today, also this morning in the session with Wendy, that a lot of countries made great efforts to include those previously included people from social protection systems by by launching large enrollment campaigns and i think uh, looking also at the at the um, graphic recording from sonia and one key point highlighted in this regard was by dr nishta is the importance of digital and financial literacy but also the necessity to coordinate across various government agencies to join the dots I also heard Pabak Maliki from Indonesia emphasizing the need for good and accurate data for social registries to which local governments can have access so that they can reach the poorest. And finally, His Excellency uh, uh, Bong Paknatun from Cambodia also showed that the innovative use of digital technologies for data collection as well interministerial coordination are key for successful program implementation and i think there are not a number of more keywords here on that uh, screen and sonia will continue doing her art and we're going to share that with you in various ways so last but not least um i think if you want to share anything about um how you perceive the session today there are there is a link i think by my colleague uh, shared on quick uh, feedback, which takes uh, two minutes. And one more last look maybe on what's ahead of us tomorrow. If you haven't really looked at it properly, we are going to have the clinics, the round tables and the virtual booth. And I highly want to promote them because this is your chance to ask, get tailored advice on specific practical questions related to the design and implementation of social protection responses to COVID-19. So there will be experts on specific aspects and you can really ask questions, the questions you might not want to ask normally in a plenary. And we are also using a tool called Slido, many of you, you know, so you can actually ask even live the questions and you can upvote the questions in your session. We have the round tables, which are a group of experts coming together on a specific topic of interest and it's uh, q and a involved and so these are the more classical formats but very very interesting um, sessions and quite a big number to choose from uh, to choose from for the round tables in the clinics and last but not least we have a virtual expo a virtual booth talks so at specific times you can visit a virtual booth and there is in an informal way you can meet an expert about flagship products of products of organizations working on social protection and a number of these organizations i think uh, you really want to talk to them so go to socialprotection.org and customize your customize your program and hope to see many of you in these sessions tomorrow i think um, last but not least a plea for you to share what you have learned on on social media and otherwise, I think that's it for today. Um, I think I have nothing more to share. I thank you all for uh, here are the views. Yeah, so about, um, of course, on the seventh the round tables on the eighth, as I mentioned before, we're going to have the panels. So this is it for 
for today. Please join us tomorrow, share your experience on social media. You can see um, how to do that. I mean, um, they, are, they can do it on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. There is a hashtag, what's next for social protection or what's next for SP. I thank you very much, all of you for joining us also on behalf of the whole team. There was a whole team helping out today and some of us will go just for a quick break and then we're gonna do the next session one more time. So see you all, stay safe, stay healthy. And I think uh, maybe let's also bring more magic into people's life as our colleague Stuart, our magician said, and I hope to see many of you in real life, in real time, somewhere later, maybe next year. So if you want to leave any words of feedback, some words of love, some ins inspiring thoughts, please leave them in the chat and enjoy. Most of you are probably going for lunch now. And otherwise, if you are calling in from other parts of the world, it might be now the time to sleep. Good night. <laughs>